David Cameron returns to the UK government as Foreign Secretary and Suella Braverman fired as Home Secretary. Fighting rages near Gaza's largest hospital with people, including babies in need of help, trapped inside. And a murder and attempted robbery suspect appears in court 32 years after crime was committed. Good evening and welcome to TVB News. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has reshuffled his cabinet. Suella Braverman has been fired as Home Secretary. James Cleverly moves from the Foreign Office to replace her. But perhaps the most surprising move of all is that former Prime Minister David Cameron is the new Foreign Secretary. David Garrett reports. Suella Braverman's future as Home Secretary was said to be hanging by a thread over the weekend. Early Monday, Rishi Sunak cut ties with his interior minister. Braverman was accused of stoking tensions when she criticised the London Metropolitan Police Force for being biased toward pro-Palestinian marches in an article for the Times newspaper last week. The piece was not sanctioned by Downing Street and did not reflect Conservative government policy. She angered many, including the police, which she oversaw, and it followed other controversial comments about migrants and homeless people. In departing, Braverman described the post as a privilege, but she had become a liability for the leader. It is the second time she has left the post of Home Secretary. James Cleverly moves into Braverman's job after being Foreign Secretary for around a year. He was seen going into number 10 to talk with Sunak Monday morning. It is more of a sideways move than a promotion. In a shock announcement, Sunak has picked former Prime Minister David Cameron as new Foreign Secretary. Cameron arrived shortly after Cleverly to emerge from the political cold. Cameron was forced out as leader when he lost the Brexit vote in 2016. He is no longer an MP, so in order to become the UK's top diplomat, Sunak has to appoint him to the upper chamber, the House of Lords, a highly irregular move which is sure to provoke debate. It's a gamble for Sunak with around a year until the next general election. David Garrett, TVB News. Thousands of people appear to have fled from Gaza's largest hospital as Israeli forces and Palestinian fighters battle outside. Gaza health authorities say Israel has yet to make moves to rescue dozens of premature babies that have been taken off incubators because of the lack of power at Al-Shifa Hospital. Israel says Hamas is using the hospital as a cover for its operations. Israel is responding to Hamas's October 7th attack on Israeli soil in which 1,200 died and some 240 hostages were taken. Nasvi Karim has more. Premature babies at Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, waiting for either Israeli troops to save them or for power to be restored at the hospital, neither of which has happened yet. Three have died after fuel that powered the hospital ran out. Around 40 more are at risk. Israel had previously offered to save the babies and move them to safer places, an offer scoffed at by Gaza officials who say there is no safe place in the area and fighting around the hospital is too intense for any rescue operation. Israel's military, the IDF, released footage of its soldiers placing 300 litres of fuel at al Shifa Hospital's doorstep, then blamed Hamas for refusing the offer. Hamas said the hospital is run by the Gaza Health Ministry, which in turn said the fuel was not enough to operate hospital generators for more than 30 minutes. Health officials also say staff are unable to reach wounded people outside the hospital because of Israeli snipers. We can't stick our heads out of the window, one official said. Hamas, meanwhile, held a press conference in Beirut, Lebanon, saying the recent Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC, meeting in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, was a step in the right direction. However, Hamas representative Usama Hamdan said while the group appreciates their efforts, they expected more concrete steps to stop the aggression against civilians and children. Hamas also said it may suspend talks in the release of some 240 hostages because of Israel's continued airstrikes and ground assaults. This as negotiations involving Israel, Qatar, the U.S. and Egypt continue in a bid to free the captives. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told ABC News that they are determined to bring home the Americans taken hostage. 
Amid fears of the Israel-Hamas conflict spreading, the U.S. military conducted airstrikes on two locations in Syria, while Israel and Lebanon's Hezbollah continued to trade fire. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said in a statement that the strikes were against Iran and its aligned groups and was in response to attacks against American forces in Syria and Iraq. Austin said they targeted a training facility and a safe house elsewhere in Syria. In another development, the Israeli military said its forces struck areas in southern Lebanon as they battle Iran-backed Hezbollah. Israel said Hezbollah had fired anti-tank missiles at a community over the border, badly wounding utility workers. Hezbollah had previously said it would not enter the war. Concerns over anti-Semitism are growing as Israel's war against Hamas continues. In France, more than 180,000 people took to the streets across the country to draw attention to rising hate crimes against Jews. Meanwhile, in Canada, a Jewish school in Montreal was hit by gunfire on Sunday. No one was injured, but it was the third time in less than a week that a Jewish school there was targeted. David Garrett reports. For the French Republic, but against anti-Semitism. That was the message on the streets of Paris. The French capital has seen many large pro-Palestinian movements since October 7th, although other cities have banned them. These people do not necessarily see themselves as the other side, but wanted to show their fears of a racist backlash against Jews. Former Presidents Nicolas Sarkozy and Francois Hollande were at the front of the group. Current leader Emmanuel Macron did not attend, but sent a message of solidarity. Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne said of Jewish citizens, we are at their side. Behind them, the numbers were huge, estimated at around 180,000 in Paris. This sign reads, Sweet France, I love you, don't make me leave. I think we are the only place in the world where such a mobilization is possible and has been made, where the Jews are attacked everywhere else in the world. So I'm very proud of my country. Police say there have been more than a thousand acts against Jews in France since the conflict started. A graffiti campaign against Jewish property is being investigated, although it is unclear if this is specifically anti-Semitic, but it has raised fears. Some people are scared, right? And it, uh, we're not talking about one person or two. And it's uh, it, and these people are part of a community, and this community represents one percent of the French population and I think it's a, it's a good idea to show that there's more than one percent of the French population that believes in these common rights. Meanwhile, in the Canadian city of Montreal, a Jewish school was hit by gunfire on Sunday. Two others in the area reported bullet holes on Thursday. No one was hurt. Toronto has received reports of crimes against Jews and Muslims. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was quoted as saying, this is not Canada. We are better than just about any country at understanding differences. David Garrett, TVB News. Back locally, a 59-year-old man was arrested over a murder and robbery case that happened over three decades ago. The arrest was made at the Shenzhen Bay checkpoint on Saturday. The murder and robbery case happened in June 1991 at a second-hand jewelry and watches shop in Shamshui Po. Three armed men took part in the crime. One of them killed an employee with a gun. The trio then fled the scene in a car, which they abandoned after hitting a traffic jam. Police from the Kowloon West Regional Crime Unit arrested a suspect at the Shenzhen Bay checkpoint on Saturday. They found the man's fingerprints matched those collected at the crime scene 32 years ago. The man is a mainlander who is trying to cross the border with his family in a seven-seater when an immigration officer discovered his name on a wanted list. The 59-year-old was charged with murder and attempted robbery. The man, surnamed Wen, was taken to Kowloon City Court this afternoon. Armed police officers stood guard outside the courthouse. The case was adjourned until January 15th. A forensic biomedical science expert says DNA can be preserved at low temperatures for many years and still produce accurate results. This after the man was arrested based on his DNA and fingerprints 32 years after a murder and attempted robbery case. Mimo Singai reports. 
DNA and fingerprint evidence are two key tools police often use to identify suspects and solve criminal cases. After arresting a suspect believed to be involved in a murder and attempted robbery case from 32 years ago, police sought help from the government laboratory, a department that conducts analytical, investigative and advisory work. Speaking to the press today, Superintendent of the Kowloon West Regional Crime Unit, Alan Jong, said a DNA test had shown that a bloodstain on a T-shirt left in an abandoned vehicle was a match for the suspect. In addition, Jong said the man's fingerprints also proved to be a match to those collected at the robbery scene in June 1991. Xavier Sito, a forensic biomedical science academic, said DNA can be preserved at below minus 80 degrees Celsius. He said the most important thing is to collect a high-quality DNA sample, meaning it has not been damaged or contaminated. Under those conditions, DNA can be kept for a long time. He said. The city's former security secretary, Lai Tong Kwok, said the evolving technology enhances the process of identity verification at broader checkpoints. The current technology can generate a formula as soon as a person places their fingerprints on a fingerprint reading machine, Lai said. Memos 9, TVB News. Still ahead, efforts to rescue at least 30 workers trapped in a collapsed tunnel in northern India. Registration for the chronic disease co-care pilot scheme begins. And the security secretary defends a $5.5 billion correctional facility rebuilding plan. Welcome back to TVB News. Rescuers in India are working to free at least 30 workers trapped in a tunnel that partially collapsed. It happened Sunday morning in the north of the country. The tunnel was being constructed on a national highway that is part of a Hindu pilgrimage route. Earth movers and trucks were removing soil to get to those trapped. Rescuers made contact with the construction group and say they are safe. Initial communication was made with a scrap of paper. They have been supplied with oxygen, food and water while they wait to be rescued. A clear path free from debris needs to be created so they can leave safely. Starting today, eligible residents can register for the chronic disease co-care pilot scheme. The plan aims to provide people with diabetes or hypertension with subsidized screening and follow-up consultations. As Sharon Tang reports, some doctors who took part in the initiative have decided to charge more than the recommended fee of $150. <laughs> Residents who wish to take part in the chronic disease co-care pilot scheme must first register in district centers. Staff members will explain the arrangements in detail and then help residents select a doctor of their own choice. Under the plan, residents aged 45 or above who suspect they have diabetes or hypertension but have not been previously diagnosed can register for screening and follow up at a subsidized cost. Participants must pay $120 up front for testing. Those who are diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension are entitled to a maximum of six subsidized consultation visits a year. Doctors are recommended to charge patients $150 per diagnosis and prescription. Some residents say they have picked a doctor who's charging less. This registrant said the testing fees are expensive in private clinics around town. She added, as I grow older, there's always something wrong with my body, but I can't exactly tell what it is. So far, only about 400 family doctors are taking part in the pilot scheme. Among them, 20% of them will charge higher than the recommended $150. Secretary for Health Lo Chung Mao stressed the point of the scheme is to offer options for residents, adding fees have always varied within the private medical system. As to whether the initiative will be extended to other chronic diseases, Lo said it will depend on the effectiveness of the current scheme. Sharon Tang, TVB News. Authorities are aiming to complete legislation on Article 23 of the Basic Law by the end of next year. Secretary for Security Chris Tang said authorities will begin consultation work after drafting the legal framework. 
He added the authorities will make the effort to do explanatory work to prevent external forces from smearing the law. Sharon Tang reports. At a meeting of the Legislative Council panel on security this morning, the security chief gave details about security-related measures announced in Chief Executive John Lee's latest policy address. Lawmakers doubted whether newly enacted legislation under Article 23 of the Basic Law may replace some of the provisions of the national security law imposed by Beijing in June 2020. The four provisions under the national security law may be covered by Article 23, so that is, it makes it easier for um, court to make judgment, for interpretation, and that it alleviates the concerns of the international society against Hong Kong. Article 23 should not be replacing the national law. Article 23 should be executed and complement with the national security law. Some people say that we don't have to legislate Article 23 because we are safe now. Some people say that we are damaging Hong Kong's image and hurting business because we mention Article 23 all the time. This is a very difficult or dangerous mindset. Tang added that after drafting the legal framework for Article 23, consultation work will begin. We believe that when we are enacting Article 23, there will be foreign forces that use this as an excuse to smear Hong Kong and the country. Article 23 legislation will only uh, impact on people who undermine national security, but not on the members of the public. Rights including freedom of expression, of assembly, will be protected under the um, United Nations uh, Human Rights Com Convention. Meanwhile, many lawmakers also raised concerns about the increasing number of non refoulement claimants who smuggle themselves into the SAR. The security secretary said the government must thoroughly fulfill its duty under international conventions in accordance with the rulings of the Court of Final Appeal. Sharon Tang, TVB News. The Secretary for Security today defended the government's $5.5 billion plan to rebuild parts of the Lai Chi Kok Reception Center. This after the LegCo Public Works Subcommittee approved the funding for the proposal earlier, despite strong opposition from some lawmakers. During last week's meeting, some called it a, quote, five-star prison project, comparing the construction cost to that of building a five-star hotel. Secretary for Security Chris Tang took the initiative to address the criticism today. He noted everyone should be respected no matter who they are, adding he will meet up with lawmaker Junius Ho, who publicly denounced the plan. Online articles have also criticized the plan as, quote, soft resistance, saying the aim is to damage the government's credibility and create more financial pressure for the administration. Tang condemned the article, stressing that all officials are faithfully performing their duties. The Housing Authority hopes more construction contractors will introduce robots to help build public housing units. This robotic machine is hard at work painting a wall. With the help of the machine, painting time can be largely reduced. However, the machine is only designed for inside use and can reach a maximum height of six meters. The Housing Authority hopes the problem of insufficient manpower in the construction sector can be addressed with the introduction of robotic machines. That's the news. Pearl Magazine is up next. See you then.